This is Weights and Wealth, your one-stop shop for entertaining education on building a stronger body and bank account. We are not doctors or financial advisors, and must warn you, this is not medical or investing advice. It is for your entertainment. Welcome back to another episode of Weights and Wealth. This is our first episode from Studio East Part 2. Uh, we're actually filming in my house right now. Um, so we got a whole new setup for you guys. This should be one of the last new setups we have. Um, <laughs> in two years, though, when Ted moves back to Charleston, we will have a brand new studio here, too. Yep. Uh, but, but for now, this is what we're sticking with. Um, so... The shout out, Ted. Ted came oh, up with the shout out. Yes. Okay. Uh, this shout out is more of a shout down, and it goes out to Fields Data Recovery for being basically a fraudulent company and screwing us. I think is what we think happened. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the hard drive that we sent out to get uh, repaired and recover all that data, that's got some missing episodes on it. Uh, I think those episodes are gone forever. Uh, Fields Data Recovery in St. Louis. Do not ever use this company. Go ahead, give them a negative star review on Google if you figure out how. Um, really bad customer service all around. We've been we've been waiting for I don't know seven weeks and there's no end in sight. We paid for uh, three to four week data recovery and mm. they've been telling us for weeks that. It was done and that they then sent us the hard drive and then they found the hard drive. They still had it, still haven't gotten it back. So, uh, yeah, shout down for this yeah. week. Fields data recovery. <laughs> I mean, we sent them the hard drive in late April. Yeah. I think we paid them May 1st and this is June 20th. Yeah. So it's supposed to be like three to four weeks. Yeah. And, and I mean, they kept telling us that like it was done they were sending it and we still have nothing to show for it so we probably lost that money unfortunately but um i don't know it's hard you got to you got to vet the companies you use i guess pretty well so uh make sure whenever you're using a company you're really checking out those google reviews there were uh looking back now at it if you look through the google reviews there were some other one star reviews that had the same exact experience we had so uh, I guess you got to really take into account the negative reviews on Google when you look at companies. Yeah. I mean, hopefully we do get it back because I know we had at least one episode on we there that was completely two. recorded and edited and yep. all that. And then we have one more, I guess. Yep. So. <clears throat> Unfortunate. Right. But yeah. moving on, we have a very interesting intro article uh, this week. So uh, recently, Joe Rogan had... RFK on Robert F. Kennedy uh, Jr. He's running for president. Uh, he's one of the Democrat uh, president hopefuls for 2024. And he's a polarizing uh, figure because a lot of people for a couple decades have not liked him because he has basically people call him an anti-vaxxer. He has uh, tried to litigate lots of different uh, environmental cases and then eventually got into vaccines after he was litigating mercury cases uh, with fish in the Hudson River and other cases. He wound up getting into the mercury that's in vaccines. And ever since 2005, no one will even debate him on vaccines. So Joe Rogan had him on. Most of his stuff usually gets taken down off YouTube, but since Joe Rogan's exclusively on Spotify, he didn't have to worry about that. And uh, the fallout from that episode on Twitter was pretty interesting. Nick, do you want to read some of the, the tweet storm there that we've got? Yeah, sure. So... Wait, so it started with... RFK going on Joe Rogan and then Joe Rogan and Professor Peter Hotez started getting in some Twitter battle, which I'm not too familiar with Twitter. So it's a little confusing reading these, but Peter said, Joe, you, you have my cell, my email. I'm always willing to, to talk with you. And then Joe Rogan basically said, this is not an answer because you won't defend it publicly, which is basically what he was trying to get at because these guys kind of know that 
Joe Rogan, RFK are coming at them and they know what they're talking about. And especially in the beginning of the episode with RFK and Joe Rogan, RFK was talking about how many doctors he's called from these pharma companies and has basically either caught them in a lie or just destroyed their argument very easily. Yeah, and Peter Hotez was on Joe Rogan during COVID. uh, And there's a lot of really famous clips from that episode where uh, Dr. Hotez talks about how he doesn't eat healthy or live a healthy lifestyle at all. And he's just going to rely on the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, to be healthy. Um, So it was a very interesting insight into how some people in the medical field think that uh, health is just drugs or vaccines that you take has nothing to do with your lifestyle, which Mm. obviously on this show we very much disagree with. Um, And then during the RFK episode, Rogan and RFK were talking about how Hotez refuses to debate RFK just like everyone else. And so then Rogan said, Peter, if you claim that what RFK Jr. is saying is misinformation, I'm offering you $100,000 to the charity of your choice if you're willing to debate him on my show with no time limit. And that was after uh, Dr. Hotez said that Spotify has stopped even trying to stem Joe Rogan's vaccine misinformation uh, in response to him being called out in this episode and uh, the what we're pulling from right now is the uh, valutainment recap on the whole twitter uh, storm here i guess and then so it just includes a lot of people's uh, tweets on on this thread and uh, tom nichols said no medical professional should ever agree to do this never It elevates the conspiracy guy, demeans the medical professional, and will only convince the kooks out there that RFK is right because a real doctor took the time to debate him, never to debate a conspiracy theorist. They went through this in the episode towards the end, how no one will debate RFK. Um, And it's just just unfortunate that they just call him a conspiracy theorist and refuse to debate him because if you listen to the episode with RFK and Joe Rogan, it would be very hard to debate RFK probably because mm. he's right about mm. pretty much everything that he's talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we'll be talking more about um, the importance of freedom of speech and being able to spread ideas and talk about things. So, I mean, it's kind of a shame that a lot of people are finding out about this through Twitter because it's very short form, like you're limited to a certain amount of characters. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of the episode, Joe Rogan said to RFK, that I'm going to try to not cut you off because things like this are so nuanced and there are so many tiny little details that matter that long form is a much better way to go about talking about these things. So it's unfortunate that like people learn about things through civil discourse and it's a shame that people won't talk publicly about things that affect the American public's health. Like I think debate should instead of having mainstream media, we should just have people talking about different ideas on TV. That would be so much much more informative. Podcasts are taking over mainstream media. The numbers for Joe Rogan's episode, I think the average Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan episode gets like 11 million views or something like that. And CNN primetime average viewership Mm -hmm. is like 300,000. So podcasts Mm -hmm. are way overtaking the establishment media, the mainstream media, no one, no one watches that anymore. People are seeking out these long form conversations with different opinions, right? I mean, Joe Rogan yeah. has every kind of person with different opinions. I mean, he's had Hotez on and he's had RFK on, right? So mm. he's got, he had Sanjay Gupta on and then he had Dr. Uh, Peter McCullough on, right? Mm. So two different doctors on the different sides of the COVID vaccine issue, right? So he really does get a full spectrum of people on. Um, And yeah, this thread, if you want to go on Valuetainment or really uh, any website, if you Google Rogan, Hotez, Twitter, Storm, whatever, uh, you'll find a lot of different links. But yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. And then uh, Patrick Bet David chimed in as well when Mark Cuban replied to the Twitter thread. And this is when I saw how Twitter has changed because I don't have a Twitter. So I always thought it was like a hundred something characters, Mm -hmm. but 
you can click show oh, more on these really tweets and they're really long. So are, I guess okay. under Elon, they've, they like changed how many characters you get. Okay. So I, I mean, think Twitter's still, becoming longer form as well. It is, but it's still extremely short compared to a book yeah. or a podcast. Yeah, definitely. They talked, I think that episode was about like three hours. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Patrick, Bet David, Joe Rogan, potential uh, future weights and wealth guests, you know? Potential future, potential. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this, this week's wealth wisdom of the week is to try to take your emotions out of your money. Now, that's a lot easier said than done, but especially when you are investing, they should just be numbers. Like, you shouldn't feel any emotional tie to that money, and you shouldn't feel good if those numbers go up and you shouldn't feel bad if they go down, you have to analyze it objectively. If that makes sense. I yeah. Mean, that's, that's yeah. funny wealth wisdom because it's kind of like saying in fitness, you have to take emotions out of like your dieting. It's not going to happen. You know, mm. like people know that they should be really disciplined with their diet, but people's emotions take over, you know? So yeah. you have to find the common ground of, how you can live your life and have your emotions affecting your decisions, but then also be successful with your investments and your diet. Yeah. And that might be a little bit easier for me just because I am an accountant and I see, you know, tens to hundred millions of dollars just move around spreadsheets every single day. So I don't know, to me, they are more just numbers yeah. and yeah. Um, but okay, this, this week's episode is how to do your financial firsts. Um, and this is a, like something that I especially kind of had a problem with when I was growing up, um, just cause I didn't really know where to start with a lot of this stuff. Like we're going to go over first job, first car, first house, which I haven't done yet. Uh, but Ted just bought his, so he can help with that. Um, but first we'll start with your first job. So Ted, what was your first job? My first, Remember? my first real job or the first way I made money? Or let's go over our first couple jobs. First couple jobs. Okay. So First way I made money was TJ's candy stand, which is when my brothers, my sister and I went to uh, BJ's, which is in the Northeast is kind of like Costco, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we would buy like packages of like big packs of candy bars and then mm -hmm. resell them to all the neighborhood kids for a dollar each. So mm -hmm. TJ's candy stand from a young age was our first entrepreneurial venture. Very nice. <laughs> and then... Uh, after that, it was mowing lawns. And then once I was old enough to get a job, I don't know what the age was, maybe 14 at the time. Uh, I was a little league umpire for, uh, I guess, throughout the rest of high school. So that was my first three jobs, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I did like cutting grass, snow shoveling. And then my first real job was working at a golf course, just cleaning golf clubs. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of going off that, one, one piece of advice I would give to people getting their first job is try to find a job where you can acquire a real skill. Because when I was doing the like the golf club cleaning, I wasn't really learning anything. I was just kind of doing basic labor. Um, granted, I got a little bit of customer service skills because I had to talk with the patrons of the golf course, mm -hmm. but I didn't really start to develop any hard skill. Um, so you'll develop skills and stuff like construction, or just really any office job, if you can get into something like bookkeeping, you know, that's something that really isn't that hard to figure out, um, or sales, or to start something on your own. Cause I mean, I'm sure you learned a couple things from your TJ's candy stand. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I do think in high school, there's still value if you can't get a job that you're going to like acquire a skill from. Mm -hmm. I still think there's value in any sort of service job. I mean, even looking back mm -hmm. at umpiring, uh, you can say that from umpiring Little League games in front of all these parents, mm -hmm. you're gaining the skill of having to make quick decisions and being confident in those decisions amongst mm -hmm. a group of older people with yeah. technically more authority than you, That's but you true. have to establish your authority over them, right? So, mm. and communication. So I think any job, if you look at it uh, from a different angle, you can still uh, learn and get experience mm. from those that uh, will help you in the future. That's every college essay ever, right? It's, oh, yeah. I learned this <laughs> and this from this job. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> And yeah, but I mean, basically what, what I was trying to get at is don't 
really worry about how much money you're making as long as you don't need the money. If it's just spending money for you, try to find a job where you can acquire the most skills because you know the difference between $10 an hour and 12 is negligible. It really won't make that big of a difference. Yeah, especially if you're in high school and you're working part-time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Ted, should we talk a little bit about our failed businesses? Oh, yes. <laughs> Speaking of our failed businesses, we'll link a uh, we'll link a little video right here within the video. But um, our setup right now, currently, we've got cameras <laughs> stacked on boxes and on turf sample pads uh, because one of our failed business mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, I guess I, I'm not really sure you would say fail. I wouldn't say we, failure. We figured we out it wasn't the best it. option. Yeah. So yeah. one of our businesses that Nick and I almost started was called Barks and Brews. And mm -hmm. it was going to be a uh, dog park where people could come and bring their dogs and get monthly memberships where they could, uh, you know, bring their dogs and your dog can run around off a leash. And then you can also get coffee and alcoholic drinks there as well and mm -hmm. hang out and we would throw events there uh, so that was going to be a really big undertaking as far as like construction and buying mm -hmm. property but nick and i were ready to do it we spent a couple months mm -hmm. planning it uh, so we've got the turf samples yeah. here we still got those <laughs> from a turf company that gave us different samples of turf for us to use and uh, i guess the biggest thing that I learned from Barks and Brews, Nick. I'm not sure what your biggest takeaway is, but uh, the biggest thing, there actually there's a couple big things, but two of the biggest things I took away were, one, it takes a lot of planning to get something like that mm -hmm. off the ground. And number two is uh, just get started on something if you're looking mm -hmm. to start a business, right? It's not always going to pan out. I forget the statistic of how many businesses fail within the first five years. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it's like seven out of 10 or nine out of 10, but most mm -hmm. businesses fail. So if you start one business and that business isn't an immediate success, well, you're not an outlier. That's most businesses, right? You're mm -hmm. probably going to have to start a few if you want to be an entrepreneur before one of them lands and hits, right? Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure it's that much higher for um, first time biz for first time entrepreneurs and then also for people who are still like early 20s. Yeah. So I think the average age of somebody who starts their own business is 40. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, a, like a lot of people, especially in their 20s, want to start their own thing. But you have to realize that, A, these things take time to build like right now we have like another little project going on with um a couple other people and you know we're planning like a year in advance yeah you know this isn't something that we expect to happen in a month or two yeah and it's an investment you know it's an investment of your time to mm. uh to build something right so i mean we spent a couple months working on barks and brews it didn't pan out. It could have maybe if we stuck mm -hmm. with it, but for multiple reasons, uh, one being me being in the army, we decided mm -hmm. <laughs> that it wasn't going to work. But, um, you know, if you never start and you never actually uh, hit the ground running with something, you're you're never going to know if it can work or not. So. Yeah. And then from that, we also learned how to write a business plan, yeah. which the second time around, it was so much easier because we already had one to kind of go off of. Exactly. Yeah. So with every failed thing that you do, you will definitely learn something. And I mean, it's honestly, you learn so much throughout the process of doing things. It's not just like the end result, but it's also what you learn along the way that is so important. Yeah. Which I know we talk about this all the time, but we have learned so much from starting this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Just I mean from from researching for these episodes and then also just putting everything together. Like we just sent out Ted's ebook. Yeah. Um and so I learned how to use Mailchimp and how to send out mass emails. So yep. like that was pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean employees like that's another huge thing. Like until you start a business, you don't realize how hard it is one to find good employees, mm -hmm. and then uh, two to I don't know. I don't want to say like. I guess never mind. I feel like employees a lot of time look at the employer with like a negative mindset. They think that they're getting robbed by mm -hmm. the employer, but on the employer side. 
it is very hard to actually find competent employees, right? Mm-hmm. I guess that's what I was I was going to say. And just third parties too, like with um the hard drive people. Yeah. Like we've kind of found out that people aren't responsive or reliable. Yeah. It's yeah. I don't know what it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> we've been through the ringer over here. We have. <laughs> All right, moving on to the car. Um, So cars are very expensive. So I would definitely recommend avoiding as long as possible um, getting a car. Like when I graduated college, I didn't have a car for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I haven't figured out how much money I saved, but it was in the multiple thousands of dollars. From A, my lease, or not lease, um, car payment, gas, insurance, all that stuff. Um, and the, and the IRS is, um, mileage reimbursement rate, which is basically the amount of money you can expense per mile for driving a car for a business is 65 and a half cents this year. And that's not just some random number that they just make up. It's the average cost to drive an average car. So for every single mile you drive between wear on your car, insurance, gas, all this other stuff, you're spending about 65 and a half cents a mile. Which, if you put it in that perspective, it, it's 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 pretty high. Like a yeah. thousand mile road trip, suddenly costs you six hundred and fifty five dollars. Yeah, there's a lot of people that think in twenty years people won't really own cars. People will Uber everywhere or use different forms of transportation, but it will basically become uh, like not financially uh, viable to like own a car, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just because of the innovations in technology and i mean just look at what uber has done to the landscape i'm like when you lived in milwaukee you didn't have a car but you still used uber all the time right i well occasionally i i lived downtown and i was close enough to walk a lot of places i did use doordash for groceries in the winter Mm -hmm. and and that was a (laughs) lifesaver um and then, I mean, I could walk to my gym, walk to work. Um, so I guess this kind of goes into kind of planning ahead of time where you live r- right after college. Like, mm-hmm. it is nice to live close to every place that, that you go to. Yeah. Um, just because you don't have to drive to those places. Um, all right. And then... As far as buying a car, um, I would never buy a new car just because of how no. fast they depreciate. Um I mean, like I got, Mm -hmm. I got my truck off a two year lease and 20,000 miles. Mm. And just from that, it was basically half the cost of what a new Mm. Silverado would have been. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, that's pretty typical when I bought my car used like the same model as mine or like the year before was going for like a thousand dollars less. So I kind of figured I might as well just get a new car. But yeah. that was at the height of COVID when the car market the used was at car its highest. market was flipped. It was weird. It was weird. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I don't know what the typical used car market is, but from what I've heard, it's it's yeah. about that. So I, I bought mine before COVID and it made way more sense to buy a mm. used car. Um, and that's, I mean, yeah, the, during COVID, the used car market got insane because of the supply mm. chain issues and everything. But uh, typically... I don't think it really makes sense to buy a new car. I think a lot of people do it because they don't want to buy a car that's going to have maintenance issues. Mm. Uh, but that's where I think if you find something off a two-year lease, like oh, yeah. my truck was, it makes a lot of sense because it's got minimal wear and tear on it. It seems like a new car, but it was like yeah. half the price, right? So uh, just because of how fast a new car depreciates in value... Um, my financial advice on this, even though we don't give a financial or investing or medical advice, mm. uh, would be to not buy a new car. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it definitely does cost more in the long run. Um, I mean, I do like the fact that I know that I have 50, 60,000 miles before I will ever really have to worry about any sort of maintenance. Um, plus, you know, it came with all like the bells and whistles inside, which is always nice. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i mean g- generally use is better and then also leasing versus buying um really only lease if so if you always want to be driving a new car every few years it is a lot more expensive but if you're somebody that who who always likes to have a new car lease but if not 
buy generally. Yeah. Um, Cause the thing with leases is they also have like mileage things. And then you have to worry about that. And you also have to worry about keeping the car in perfect shape. Um, and it's just generally not a great idea to lease things, but you don't have to worry about things breaking down and having those maintenance costs. That's true. So yeah. I guess it just depends if, I mean, if you're someone that knows nothing about cars and would never do any work on your car yourself, mm. then maybe that is a more appealing option to you. I personally mm. like doing most of the stuff on my truck. Mm. I recently just got my suspension redone after 100,000 miles. I didn't do that myself because mm. I've done tie rods before and I went onto YouTube and looked at redoing the suspension and it was like, okay, take the tie rods off. I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no way. This is going to be like an 18 hour project. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, also, like I don't have a hydraulic lift at my house. So yeah. I, was, I was just like, no, not, not going to happen. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. I get frustrated working on a car. I, was, I did on the Suburban a little bit. I mean, I haven't had to touch this car yet, yeah. um, but I get frustrated but also on buying, I just kind of like to know that I own something rather than the fact that I have to give it back and I have nothing to show for it after I made these payments for three years. It's kind of like owning it's, a house versus renting. It feels yeah. different when you like own it. I don't know. It does. It, it gives you a sense of like satisfaction kind of, yeah. you know, like I like this. It like I live here, but I feel like it's not really mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so we're going on to buying your first house. Um Ted, do you want to talk a little? I mean, I know, sure. I know you have in the past. Yeah. Um, um, so for me, I think the biggest thing financially that people worry about with the house is trying to time the market. But mm. that is really, really hard to do. Um, we talk about higher standard quite a bit. Chris and Saeed, potential future higher, uh, mm. potential future weights and wealth guests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um They've been trying to not really predict the market, but with, let's see, it would have been beginning of 2022, how they were saying, oh, like January 2022 is when the recession started. And they've been talking for a while about lagging indicators in the housing mm -hmm. market and how they expect the housing market to drop like 15, maybe 20%. But housing market finally dipped, but it hasn't done what people thought it would do. It's just really hard to time the market. And if you do need somewhere to live, like for Alex and I, we wanted to buy a house. We didn't want to try to rent a place for six months and then buy. It was like, all right, let's just move into a house once we get married. We're not going to worry about renting and then buying. We're just going to we're just going to buy a house. So timing for the market might not be the best, but it's going to be more convenient. We're just going to do it. We made that decision. So yeah. it's a utility. You do need mm -hmm. a place to live. So if you are looking to buy because you want a place to settle down and live, just just buy it. Don't worry about. I guess don't really worry about trying to time the market. Yeah, I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of the people out there really shouldn't try to time the market when it comes to investments. I mean, Chris and Said are bankers. Mm -hmm. Like they're in, they're deep in the financial world. Yeah. They know enough to try to predict this stuff and to trust themselves on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, experts are wrong because experts take both sides of the issue. Um, but definitely for your average person, it, it doesn't make sense to try to time the market. Like I wouldn't try to time the market. Yeah. And I well, like interest rates were going up when I moved to Clarksville. I had missed that like 3% interest rate, the tail end of the ZERP. So it, interest rates were increasing, but I bought down just in case they kept increasing. I, mm. I bought down the rate. So when you buy a house, you can uh, pay extra when you buy your house to buy down the uh, mortgage rate from your lender, right? So you can give them... Mm. X number of thousands of dollars and then your mortgage rate is half a percent or a percent lower. Uh, so that's what Alex and I did just in case the interest rates keep increasing because if they do decrease, we could just refinance and get a lower interest rate. But um, with inflation not really going away as fast as people thought it would, I was worried about interest rates just continually increasing and not having a good time to refinance. So we just decided to buy down the rate. But um, yeah. I, mean, I did ask Chris and Saeed their opinion when I was like, cause yeah. I knew I was buying a house 
and I kind of knew their opinion based off listening to the higher standard. And I was like, hey, this is what I'm looking at doing. And it was just crickets. And they usually, they usually respond to us, but it was just crickets. Yeah. Because they, <laughs> they didn't want to say anything. Um, but, you know, um, at the end of the day, like I was saying, a house is a utility. So a lot of people will say a house is an asset. Um, if it's not cash flowing, if you're living in it and you're not cash flowing it, uh, this is Robert Kiyosaki goes into this in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Is mm. it really an asset if it's not cash flowing? So mm. um, I don't know. I, well, don't, I don't think it's an asset. I kind of side with Robert Kiyosaki, but mm. I also... I don't know. It's kind of in the middle, I think, between an asset and a liability. Like Robert Kiyosaki mm. says it's a liability if you're living in it, mm. but because it normally will appreciate in value, I don't necessarily think it's a liability. I would kind of put it in the middle. Well, okay, I mean, we talked about this earlier. On a balance sheet, a house is an asset. Yeah. The mortgage would be the liability because yes. that's what you owe. An yep. asset is what you own and and you you own your house. Um, and like, the thing is, if you don't have a house, I really like it, it gives you the, the ability to, I mean, have a job. If you don't have a house, it's very hard to have a job, you I'm know, you if you could live out of your car. You're talking about if you don't have somewhere to live. Somewhere to live. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I kind yeah. of forget where You I'm need talking. shelter in you general. Do. So yeah. Um, a lot of people in California live in tents, but yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, oh, slight no. slight jab at LA and San Francisco. Oh, one one other thing I wanted to add on time in the market is that I think it would be a lot easier to, or not, maybe maybe not easier, but it wouldn't be as hard to time the market if we if we didn't have something like the Fed that could really like throw a wrench in things and mm-hmm. prevent things from working how they would naturally work. Um, because I know Chris and Saeed are always talking about how the Fed's raising interest rates or they're not at raising interest rates. Um, and that can really can have a substantial impact on the market, yeah. which makes it that much harder to time because you have all these factors and then also some outside influence that can kind of do whatever it wants. Yeah. Every month they make a decision that people have a very hard time predicting if interest they're going to just increase or decrease or keep interest rates the same, which then affects the market. It's funny mm. if you watch like the stock market immediately when the Fed makes its decision like it will go like up or down based off their decision and changing interest rates. <laughs> yeah, which yeah, yeah, it's it's, it, it's kind of crazy how such a small change can just throw the market. Yeah. Um, but okay, and then on where to buy, if you are looking for a house to appreciate, there are some general rules of thumbs. Um, the worst house in a decent neighborhood, um, which those are not always the easiest to find because real estate investors know that rule yeah. too. So they are in, they can be kind of hard to find. Um, and then also off off of a main road a little bit. Like if you're on a main road, a lot of people don't like traffic, stuff like that. Yeah, um, or they don't want their dog or their kids having the chance of running out into the main road. So a lot mm-hmm. of times there'll be less value right on the main road than in a neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and then how to finance. Uh, the, the, the two most common ways are a conventional loan or an FHA loan. Um, and then you can also like the military has something special, which is similar to an FHA loan. I, th- I think you can do zero down. Um, but for a conventional loan, you usually just have to put 20% down and then you can finance the rest. FHA, I think it's three and a half percent down and then finance the rest. But the only caveat with that is that you have to pay, pay mortgage insurance on that, which is essentially if you were to go bankrupt and, or your house had to be cor- for, foreclosed upon it insures the bank. Like you're not really insuring yourself. You're insuring the bank that they will get their their money back. Yeah, and the thing with like an FHA or a VA loan uh, or a USDA loan, if you're looking for more rural property, is that your monthly payment is going to be higher because there's less down. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, much higher. Yeah. Yeah, and then what to buy? I know, Ted, you were saying you bought a three-bed, two-bath. Yeah, yeah, so... For, for us, because when we move on from Clarksville, we want to be able to rent out the house that we got. So when we were looking at houses, we passed on the house, even if we liked it, if it wasn't going to make sense to cash flow when we want to rent it out. And typically, if you want to rent out a house, you want to look for a three bed, two bath 
That way you can get multiple people that want to split the house and live as roommates and you can get young families, growing families. If you're less than three bed, two bath, you wind up excluding a large portion of the population uh, that would be able to rent from you and then you have less people that can rent, which means mm. you're going to get a lower monthly payment. <laughs> yeah, and then and then once you start to get higher, you know, by the time people have three, four kids, they will usually be buying their house because they'll be in a place to buy their house. Um, and then also, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't say it's too common to really have four or five roommates once you're out of college. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, the like the house I'm in now, it's a three bed, two and a half bath. And I honestly, I probably wouldn't want any more roommates. I think two's a good amount to have. Yeah. I mean, if you're living in a big city, you don't really have a choice. If you're yeah. living in New York City in a 300 <laughs> square foot apartment, you got eight roommates is what it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or Charleston, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yeah. rent's pretty expensive here, too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been going up. It, well, in the city, yeah, mm -hmm. you can still get, you know, if you are if you go 20 minutes out, it's, I think, pretty reasonable. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely been going up just as everybody's been moving here. I mean, there are apartment buildings going up left and right yeah everywhere yeah. so hopefully that'll drop it a little bit but yeah. it is what it is what do we have after houses um that was it that was it yeah all Unless right so there's any other first you want to talk about no i think that's good for financial firsts uh mm. we did do an episode a while back on doing your first uh like ira 401k your first investing that you just kind of uh, automate and we did get a lot of good feedback on that episode we had mm. people messaging us saying hey i just started <laughs> I, I opened up uh ira and started investing in it so yeah. that was really great to hear so if you're learning stuff from the podcast and you take action on it which is our goal for um all the young men or young people or older people whoever mm. listens to it i mean our target demographic is young men but mm. i think like we still have 40% of our audience is is women, which is, is really? which is great. Yeah. Um, I guess we don't do enough uh, targeting to our target demographic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, if you do learn yeah. stuff from the podcast and take action on it, definitely let us know because we like to hear that feedback. Yeah. Or, or if you have any questions, we have our WhatsApp is now on our website. Or you can always email us or just DM us on Instagram mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, and Nick mentioned the ebook that uh, we just came out with. If you're interested in getting the free testosterone ebook, head to the website, throw your email in there, and we'll get that sent out to you. Yeah, and and if you did put your email in but you haven't gotten it yet, we do have to send it out manually. So there's a chance that we miss somebody's email who submitted it. I'm pretty sure I hit everybody, but if we did miss you, please just. Su submit it again and then we will get it to you yeah I, th I think we're good when we went through uh the emails but a problem for some people is that it was going to their junk mail which we are working yes. on refining our mailchimp mm -hmm. uh strategy so it doesn't do that <laughs> but uh if you did give us your email either through instagram or through the website uh check your junk mail folder if you never got it all right guys thank you Thanks for joining us today at Weights and Wealth. And don't forget to apply today's lessons to live healthy and wealthy. If this conversation will contribute to your fitness and financial gains, please share it with a friend or family member and give a five-star review so more people can lift bigger weights and get bigger bank accounts.